Baby. Hey guys, we're back. This is Fall Streak. Despite our morning antics, we somehow managed to arrive at school early. Upon entering the one classroom building, an array of empty desks meets us, save for one. Amidst the illuminating light of early morning, she was there. A young woman whose presence held a mysterious allure to it. With immaculate form and perfect posture, she sat unmoving at one of the far side desks. Good morning, Erwina. Hey, Erwina. Hello, Aid, Kalia. Angling her head in our direction, Erwina returns our greeting with a vague nod. While I knew Erwina was the oldest student at our school, it was difficult to get a good read on her age with how her eyes were always bandaged over. A flower that suits aid. I couldn't find one. Ha, ha, we made it. Iletta, Lorona, and Tristan as well. As if taking his cue, Trist summarily kneels over and kisses the ground. Don't mind him, that's just Trist being the usual drama queen. I see. Something felt different about Erwina today. She felt absent-minded, her responses subdued, lacking their usual self-possessed weight. Is something troubling you, Erwina? Now that I think about it, wasn't it odd she was sitting back here at this back row desk? Feel free to tell us about it. I love to meddle, you know. You're quite perceptive, aren't you, Aid? With a light chuckle, Erwina traces her finger across the surface of the desk before her. It's true that I have something on my mind. As you may know, none of the, de the desks in the back row are currently in use. Everyone occupies a some spot in the world in terms of space and resources. However, it is not as though the school is lacking in those. Even though the possibility of filling these vacancies exists, it remains unrealized. Erwina's idle hand motions come to a stop, her voice taking on a m mysterious tone. It's a strange feeling, this feeling that where someone could be, there is no one. Where someone could be, there is no one. Erwina's words conjure a certain image in my mind's eye, an image of her sitting here lost in thought all alone, thinking, perhaps, of the absent warmth of someone who would have been here with us today had the cards fallen differently. Sorry, Erwina, but there might be less space in this school than you think. If you look at the desks back here, you'll find they're all stuffed to the brim with books. Seems like the hoard of some hopeless bibliophile. So yeah, we might not actually have room for new students. The heck? If we don't get any new classmates because Aid's such a bookworm, I'm gonna be mad. At least my books don't sell me out. <laughs> I suppose it would get rather cramped, given how lively it already gets around here. I will probably have to report the troublemaker using school property without permission, though. Take me away, officer. I jest, of course. Schools are for learning, after all. It is senseless to hit the hen for laying eggs. Now that I think of it, though, the five of you are here quite early today. That's right. We're really pumped up for today's competition. Is Mr. Narao not here yet? It appears Lorona's attempts to resuscitate her fallen comrade have not been bearing fruit. Worry not, father will be arriving shortly. That's right, though a student in name, it was more accurate to say Erwina taught alongside her father, if anything. Oh? Long have I awaited the day my students arrive early, such as their enthusiasm to learn. Mr. Narao, an ex eccentric individual who had constructed this school using his own fortune in the wake of the fire of collapse. The fact that he even personally taught this test was testament to his dedication to the next generation. I still remember his baffling self-introduction upon meeting everyone at the beginning of the school year. Narao can be interpreted to mean white wings of learning. It is difficult for you to understand. You may refer to me as Mr. Narao for now. Just like on that first day, our enigmatic teacher was casually toting around a gargantuan valise. I doubt anyone has my morning lark over here beat in terms of getting up at god-awful hours, though. 
Parting with one's bed sheets isn't a Herculean ordeal for everyone, Mr. Night Owl. Smiling wryly, Irwina rises to assist Mr. Narao with unpacking the valise's contents. Though she generally relies on a retractable rod to navigate, I've noticed that sometimes she just doesn't seem to need it. I wonder how she does it. That thing sure is living up to its reputation as a bottomless black hole, isn't it? We watch as one of the valise palpably shrinks as it is released from its bulging payload. I don't know what a valise is, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, so yeah. Is this for the construction competition? What looked like a disassembled table and the components of a board game had been laid out before us. Ah, about that. I have decided to postpone the bridge building contest until tomorrow. We will be having a lecture on the history of Socatrine instead, with those materials serving as a visual aid. No, it can't be true. It was all in vain. It was all in vain. Blah. Letting out a strange cry, Lorona sinks to the ground with a soft thump. The floor seemed to be quite the popular resting spot today. Aid, I don't have to use your materials. Though she probably means to say something along the lines of, it's good I don't have to impose on you again, I decide to misinterpret it. I see. I knew this day would come. You've finally grown sick and tired of me and my shoddy materials. I understand, Aletta. I'm just not good enough for you anymore. Even then, I never imagined it would hurt this much to get discarded and forgotten. Wiping up my eyes, I sniffle and lower my gaze. It, it's not like I want you to use my materials or anything. Aid, I'll use ma your materials, so don't be sad. She looked like she was about to cry. There were actually tears in her eyes. You're so devoted, Noletta. Unable to contain myself, I giggle as I reach up to, p to pinch her on the cheek. M me she makes some weird noises, but doesn't try to resist as I play with her face. We will wait for several more students to arrive before commencing class. Our class had around 12 regular students in total. Since it had such an, a wide age range, lessons could fluctuate between learning basic language one day to advanced science the next. Fortunately, the school was well equipped for dealing with its unique circumstances. I guess that's one of the perks of being funded by a wealthy teacher. Those of us still standing kill some time poking at Lorona and Triss before class finally begins. Now then, without further ado, let us begin the lecture on Socatrine's history. The entire class was gathered around what could only be described as an oversized board game. Mr. Narao has always had an unorthodox style of teaching. Conventional teaching tends to lean toward fixed methods and rote memorization, but Mr. Narao was fond of something he called divergent thinking. As much as he tries to dress it up, though, I'm pretty sure he just gets bored easily. Is this a map of Socatrine? Indeed, it's far from accurate in terms of scale, but this board game has been laid out to simulate Socatrine's basic layout. Overall, Socatrine can be divided broadly into five areas. Ooh, I'm gonna butcher these words. The Chironterra Plains, the Urban Core, the Greater and Lower Padavelt Highlands, and the Muted Forest of the East. With a wave of his pointing stick, Mr. Narao redirects our attention to the blank boundary surrounding the hexes. One of Socatrine's most distinguishing features is a dense wall of unavagable mist that surrounds and separates it from the outside unknown lands. Mr. Narao, Mr. Narao, what are the board game pieces supposed to be? You can think of the boxes as population concentration indicators and the cylinders as major industrial centers. The big piece in the center represents the heart of the Socatrine's infrastructure, the capital city of Socotra. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Aid, where do we live? Hmm, probably around here somewhere? As for the school, it's likely near here. Aid, maps are really amazing. What do you mean? They show the world like you're high in the sky, even though nobody's been in the sky before. Hmm, that's not true. I've been in the sky before, you know. 
Really? Wow. You shouldn't believe everything Aid says, Noletta. This is the year 195, right? I was born in 194? That is correct. The current board state reflects the state of Sakatrine 15 years ago when it was ruled by the old ar aristocracy. Sakatrine was in the process of recovering from a period of famine and plague when the Master's Revolution occurred. The Master's Revolution was when people from the Unknown Lands came, right? Yes, Sakatrine had long been aware of the existence of the Unknown Lands from artifacts that washed up on Evaya's northern banks. Evets? Evaya's? I don't know. <laughs> However, 195 marked the first time that actual people came from beyond the mist. In 195, a convoy of people describing themselves as refugees from a devastated land sailed down the river Evayet, I don't know, and made contact with Sakatrine for the first time. Though the old aristocracy welcomed the refugees at first, they eventually began to suspect that the convoy would attempt a coup. Mustering all of Sakatrine's military might, the old aristocracy of attempted to preemptively capture the refugees. However, they were soundly routed by the refugee convoy's elite combat unit, the Lost Children. In what came to be known as the Master's Revolution, the old aristocracy had overthrown and the leader of the Lost Children and refugee convoy, the Verloren Master, was installed at Sakatrin's sovereign ruler. Is it true? Is it true that a Verloren Master was a girl? The Verloren Master was indeed female, though it would be more accurate to call her a woman than a girl. I heard she was a genius swordmaster that took down a squad of Sakatrin's finest all by herself. There are rumors her unit annihilated entire armies back when she was in the Unknown Lands. Sounds like she was pretty good at bashing heads, but was the Verloren Master a good ruler? In regards to that, let us jump ahead to the year 200. Mr. Narao takes the opportunity to make adjustments to the board state before continuing. The five years that followed the Master's Revolution are often considered a golden age in Sacratroni history. Drawing from the advanced technology, expertise, and knowledge the refugee convoy brought with them, Sacratrine underwent a period of rapid innovation and reform. Mortality rates plummeted as contemporary medical science made its debut and birth rates skyrocketed as socioeconomic living standards improved. However, that all came to a stop when the fire of collapse happened. A solemn silence overtook the room as Mr. Narao set about making major modifications to the board. I had been born shortly after the fire of collapse, so I had no memories of the event but there was no doubt it had been a dark time in Sakatrine's history. In August of 200, for reasons that are not known, the shroud of mist that usually surrounds Sakatrine's borders warped and covered the sky. Prismatic flames of unknown properties rained down from the mist, laying waste to major swaths of Sakatrine's landscapes. The area below Eve Eve I am butchering this word so many times. The area below Evihet's southern banks suffered serious damage in particular, transforming into unrecognizable wasteland. Look at all the boxes that disappeared. I remember if you got burned by that rainbow fire, you had to get special treatment, or else... The refugees of 195 had experienced a similar disaster in the unknown lands, so they were able to provide limited care, but there were too many victims to avoid a great loss of life. The fire of collapse did not mark the end of 200, though. In 195, the Verloren master had taken on a single Sakatroni pupil following her rise to power. Shortly after the fire of collapse, that pupil challenged the Verloren master to single combat, defeating her and claiming the title of Sakatrine's sovereign ruler as his own. He continues to rule Sakatrine to this day. We know him now as Lord Cecil Cotterd. Aid, Aid, that's your daddy, right? Yep, that's my pops, all right. He must have been crazy strong to, the, to defeat the Vorloran Master. Hmm. 
I've always wondered what kind of relationship Papa had with his master. I just don't understand for what reason did Papa feel compelled to usurp the Valerian master. Unfortunately, there is not much insight that I can offer on that matter. It is true, though, that Lord Cotterd is largely carried on his master's legacy in terms of policy. That just made things more confusing. The pieces simply weren't lining up. Naturally, there were some that opposed Lord Cotterd's succession. Unconvinced that the inexperienced young Cotterd could lead Sacatrine in its weakened state, the remnants of the old aristocracy took the opportunity to attempt an uprising. However, having also inherited leadership of the lost children, Lord Cotterd crushed the uprising, scattering his, op his opposition and consolidating his rule. It is now at last that we arrive at the current day of 210. Sakatrine's reconstruction has been a slow and steady process, but it has been helped along by several unexpected boons. Though I mentioned before how the fire of collapse had mysterious properties, one particularly unusual effect it's had can be observed in what used to be the southern wastelands. It is believed the ashes of the rainbow fire nourish the soil somehow as the land has recovered at an alarming rate, blooming into what is now known as Evahet's Garden. It's scary how pretty that place is. How many townspeople avoid it because they're afraid of the unfamiliar types of flowers that blossom there. In any case, that concludes my lecture. Irwina will now take over for any questions that you may have. Passing the helm to Irwina, Mr. Norau retreats to his desk for a breather. I've been curious about this for a while, but don't the refugees from the unknown lands have a name for the place that they came from? That is a delicate topic. It is something of a taboo for the refugees of 195 to speak the name of their homeland. It is believed that for many of them, the name of their homeland is synonymous with atrocity. As such, they are often simply referred to as ULs. In that case, what about the Verloren Master? What was her name before she assumed her title? Hmm. The Vorloran Master is a big enigma even today. Her real name is likely something only members of the Lost Children know. I see. Perhaps I should ask Papa uh, or Mr. Damalur sometime. <laughs> sometime. Sometime. <laughs> That's all the questions I have for now. Surrendering the floor to the other students, I wander over to the classroom windows lost in thought. Sakatrine's Closed World Dilemma There has only been one recorded instance of anyone successfully traversing the boundary of mist that encircles Sakatrine's borders. The Verloran Master, how did she lead the refugee convoy to Sakatrine? I couldn't help but feel it was a key piece to the puzzle, a puzzle that I've yearned to solve for as long as I can remember. Not enough. It's still not enough. When I come back to myself, I find the class in the midst of lunch break. Wandering over to our usual group's island of desks, I've, I'm met with a pleasant surprise. Erwina had pulled her desk over as well, bringing our count up to a total of six. Erwina usually eats with her father at his insistence, but it seemed our capricious teacher was taking a nap, having gobbled up his lunch during the Q&A session. I take my seat amidst an already continuing conversation. Uh, what? Dasu raitu... I don't know, guys. <laughs> I see. Are you and Tris planning to do anything special for your 12th birthday? Newfound respect wells up inside me at Arwena's ability to comprehend Kalia's incoherent uh, gabbling. Yeah, same. I'm super respect. Yep. Kalia wasn't very fond of being fed by other people. As such, it was not uncommon for unintelligible garbling to leave her mouth as she went about stuffing her lunch with her face. Stuffing her lunch? Stuffing her face with her lunch, though? Even after the Second Great Food War, may the casualties of that dark time rest in peace, we only ever gain the right to clean her face after a meal. Mmm... While not as animated as Kalia, watching Erwina eat was also an interesting experience. The manner in which she confirmed the position of her lunchbox, selected an article of food by its relative remaining proportion, 
and brought it lovely to her mouth was like clockwork. Yeah, I'm not even going to try. But yeah, she's talking with her mouth full. Jeez, Kalia, don't I always tell you not to talk with your mouth full? Evhet's garden, though, huh? That's a wonderful spot to go for your birthday. Could it be somehow I'm the abnormal one for having no clue what Kalia's saying? As she alternates between chastisement and casual conversation, Lorona picks out a tasty-looking morsel from Tristan's lunchbox. Since the five of us always share our lunch together, we had a habit of taking from each other without restraint. It was something we did without even thinking about it. So, it wasn't hard to understand why our guest Erwina froze in shock when her spoon suddenly encountered Tristan's fork scrounging around in her lunchbox. Uh... Ah, huh? What are you doing, Twish? <laughs> I don't just... Don't just go picking through Erwina's lunch without her permission. A brutal kick from Kalia to some undefined location under the desk causes Trist to spray a mouthful of his lunch all over an unfortunate Lorona. Yeah, who, what is happening? <laughs> You'll have to forgive us, Erwina. We're all accustomed to sharing our food with each other. I guess Tris couldn't resist upon seeing how tasty your food looked. Ah, is that so? Erwina pauses for a second as she is considering my words. In that case, allow me to sample what you've brought as well. A well-meaning smile rises to her lips as she pushes her lunchbox forward, signaling it's fine to take from her. At her invitation, the five of us, who had always been curious about the palate of rich people, eagerly dig in. Wow, it's so delicious! I didn't know you were such a good chef, Rowena. Hey, Tris, stop stuffing yourself and give me some of that bourgeoisie -y? goodie. <laughs> Naturally, Kalia didn't seem to have any issue accepting aid when it came to jacking the best parts of a meal. Come on, Noletta, open up. You can't just eat nothing but pasta all day. M say ah. <laughs> I poke at Noletta's mouth with, with a spoonful of Rowena's lunch until she reluctantly parts her lips. Getting this child to eat something other than pasta could often be quite the struggle. After ensuring that Noletta would be safe from malnutrition for another day, I have a sample of my own. Hmm. So this was what Erwina ate. Though it was certainly tasty, something seemed a bit off about it. Just to clarify, I didn't make any of this. It gets a bit chaotic when I'm in the kitchen. As if recalling a silly memory, Erwina shakes her head. Of course, Father didn't make it either. With measured movements, Erwina probes through the lunchboxes we had placed in front of her for easy access. How do you fancy the dishes of commoners, my lady? Refreshingly proletarian, if I, might, if I may say. Why, I simply must have more. I really am quite fond of your lunches, though. How do I describe it? It feels like they were somehow made with warmth. I much prefer them to my own. Indeed. Though the taste was on point somehow, Erwina's lunch didn't feel very filling. It was strange. I'm glad you like it. Feel free to eat again with us anytime. If you ever find your pop snoozing through lunch again, you're welcome to hang with the cool kids. Uh, don't know. Meanwhile, the Lariat twins try to play it cool as they rapidly clean Erwina's lunchbox of its contents. You have my gratitude. Let us rendezvous in the future again sometime. The simple act of sharing one's food with others makes it tastier, after all. Can't wait until tomorrow, though. Me and Triss spent all night yesterday studying up on bridges. There's no way we'll lose. Perhaps it was meant to be a declaration of resolve or something of the sort. But with how her face was innocuously smeared with food, she looked more like a bib-toting toddler than a bold competitor. Unable to stomach the yucky sight, Triss immediately butts in and starts wiping Kalia down with a handkerchief. Geez, Triss, can't you read the atmosphere? Kati <laughs> Atmosphere. I can read it. <laughs> Forget what I said before, Arwina. <laughs> We're not cool kids at all. We're pretty lame, actually. With an inquiring tilt of her head, Arwina listens on as the rest of us break out into laughter. She probably didn't fully understand what was going on, but she smiles warmly at the good cheer we surround her with. 
Meals really are the best when shared in the company of others. Oh, uh, has lunch break been over for a while now? Yes, but it appears that Mr. Norau has more pressing obligations to attend to. Our ever-dedicated school teacher was currently in the process of revising today's lesson plans with his face roll. He fell asleep again? How many times must he be punished before he learns his lesson? With a grin that proves he's up to no good, Trist taps on Kelia's shoulder and gestures shadily at Mr. Nowral's defenseless figure. Comprehending his intentions with ease, Kalia snickers ambitiously. Hey, Erwina, would you turn a blind eye if we decided to play a prank on your dad? Yes. I suppose it can't be helped. Just don't let things get too out of hand. I just want to point out, he asked if she would turn a blind eye, and, like, she's literally blind. So, yeah. Gaffs everywhere. Alright, good. So, Erwina's in. What should we do now, though? The lyrics rip repertoire of pranks was quite expansive, but their usual antics wouldn't cut it if they wanted to do something Erwina couldn't appreciate. Scanning the room for ideas, my eyes catch on Noletta as she plays around with Susie, a younger classmate. The little one was teasing Noletta in a sa saturine sa yeah, I guess. A uh, voice as she floated a balloon in and out of her reach. The scales have fallen from my eyes. We'll give him helium voice. With a grand gesture, I direct everyone's attention to the enlightening scene before us. In the highest form of approval, Triss spontaneously produces a white cat from somewhere and begins stroking it like an evil mastermind. I'm really feline it. Oh, jeez. Firing off a clawful pun, Kalia and Triss set off to procure the balloon. Father, with helium voice, I cannot say the prospect is without appeal. You shouldn't do bad things to people who are sleeping. Remember last time when you tied my sleeves together when I was sleeping? That was so mean. T-Rex Lorona is best Lorona. Likely due to her overloaded schedule, Lorona had a habit of switching off whenever she was rendered even remotely cozy. Naturally, that put her on the receiving end of countless pranks on our part. But, hmm, it's also really bad to fall asleep in class as a teacher. Uh, I don't know, I can't stop imagining Mr. Narao squeaking like a cute little mouse. With our moral compass comprised by internal conflict, there was nothing left to stand in the way of our schemes. Upon successfully persuading the owner, the Lyrit twins return with Noletta and Balloon in tow. Alright, so who will be the lucky soul carrying this out? Triss is good at being quiet. <laughs> As if he'd been shot through the heart, Triss slumps to the ground, cat scampering from his hand. This isn't even gaff territory anymore. This is just plain harassment. Triss is KIA. I'm not suitable for the job because reasons. And Noletta and Lorona are Noletta and Lorona. Therefore, I nominate Aid to bear the torch. I will seize the scepter of victory. Roused by Kalia's flawless reasoning, I brandish the balloon with steeled resolve. If what you need to do entails ensuring that father stays asleep, I can also be of service. He has a peculiar habit of sleeping deeply when his head is scratched a certain way. With uncanny composure, Erwina discloses shocking intel to us. How he's like a kitty cat. It's decided then. Let Operation Felium begin. With a grand sweeping motion, I announce the commencement of our mission. I'll be counting on you to disable the dragon while I sneak into his lair to loot the gold, Erwina. Today is the first time we've involved Erwina in one of our missions. As such, no matter how fraught with peril his, this understanding may be, failure cannot be allowed. Mission, start! Ducking into the shadows of one of the first row desks, I stand by as Erwina moves into position. With the wisdom of a weathered sage, she works her magic, chanting forbidden verses from a world beyond our own. <laughs> meow, meow, nyan. 
These verses, of course, had a mild resemblance to the meowing of a kitten, but I digress. The slumbering dragon's dangling glob of drool expands in size as the great sorcery takes effect. When Erwina signals in my general direction, I rapidly commence my infiltration. Posturing myself next to the throne, I look back to see that all of our comrades are watching with bated breath. Everyone is counting on me. Reveling in the sensation of pressure, I carefully undo the knot keeping the balloon shut before bringing it to my quarry's mouth. Doing this properly was a delicate balancing act. Too little and it would have no effect, too much and our harmless prank could veer into dangerous territory. So now or never, gouge yeah, gouging the rhythm of its inhalations, I wait for the perfect window to release the balloon's opening. The dragon's eyelids twitch in discomfort as, it, as its lungs abruptly fill with helium. Fall back! Fall back! Pulling away, I whisper as loud as I dare to Erwina. The two of us swiftly withdraw, taking our seats just as Mr. Narao stirs and shakes his head in disorientation. Noticing the room full of diligently waiting students, he opens his mouth to apologize. It's <laughs> so tiny. Hey, dear, my apologies for keeping you all waiting. I'm totally gonna mess with that and put it in, like, super high-pitched. <laughs> um, his squeaky voice issues a series of sniggers from the kids with less restraint. Hmm, is there someone on my face? Faced with his clueless expression, even the students with greater willpower were beginning to waver. At the classroom full of children on the verge of cracking, Mr. Narao could only look on in confusion. Erwina, what did you guys do? Whatever do you mean, Father? The students are merely amused by the squeaky persona you suddenly started acting out. The dam finally breaks at Erwina's feign of ignorance. Unable to hold it back anymore, the room floods with bouts of laughter. Huh? Now that you mention it, my voice does sound unusually high-pitched. Who did this? Mr. Norrell's attempt to menace us in his harmless, mousy voice prompts several kids to fall out of their seat. The sight of everyone rolling around on the floors as they held their stomachs was quite the spectacle. Mr. Norrell's eyes swept over the classroom angrily for a while before eventually coming to rest on a certain desk. Didn't you bring a balloon here for your birthday, Susie? Mr. Norrell presses a palm to his face as he pieces it together. You miss your little cretin. That's it, outside, right now. Even the dispensing of our punishment only goads more laughter out of us because of its uh, delivery in a shrill, innocuous voice. I'm struggling again. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> when I look over at Erwina's seat, it pleases me to see that she is laughing her heart out alongside the rest of us. Even after carrying out our penance, the only thing anyone had to say about the whole ordeal was worth it. Stoic and detached, that was the kind of air Erwina always seemed to carry about her. I'm glad we were able to close the distance and see her smile wholeheartedly for once. Mission accomplished. Alright guys, that's going to be it for this episode, so stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks for watching!